Hi Bookworms! What you're about to hear is an episode from the Hidden Bookcase Patreon, covering the first two seasons of The Bright Sessions, a sci-fi slice-of-life audio drama following everyday people with superpowers set in a therapist's office. We've been uploading to our Patreon since July of last year, including bonus episodes like this one where we discuss everything from essays such as Samantha Shannon's Miss Magazine article about feminism and historical fantasy, to short stories such as Alex E. Harrow's Six Deaths of the Saint. We also share playlists inspired by the books we've read on the show, outtakes, and more. We'll be covering the rest of the Bright Sessions over there. The episode covering Season 3 and 4 is up right now, and episodes covering the AM archives and the college tapes are on their way. If you're interested, the Hidden Bookcase Patreon is on a flat pay structure, so you can gain access to all of this extra content for as little as £3 per month. The link is in the show notes. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and we hope you enjoy this Patreon episode of The Hidden Bookcase. Welcome to The Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be read pile. I'm Morgan, I use they-them pronouns, and I am the ulterior motives of your supernatural therapist. I'm Soren, I use he-him pronouns, and I am not pleased that YOLO was a thing. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight, we take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. Today, we're mixing things up and returning to an audio drama that has shaped how both of us think about storytelling. So today, let's get to talking about... The Bright Sessions by Lauren Shippen. Seasons 1-2. to two. I guess we have to talk about how we found The Bright Sessions. Do you remember... Or did I tell you about The Bright Sessions? I think you told me about The Bright Sessions. I want to say you introduced me to it. I feel like with most things in our friendship, you introduced me to it and then I got obsessed with it beyond proportion. To be fair, I was also quite obsessed with it. (laughs) I did remember on my way home yesterday, I was like, I swear there's like a group chat on Snapchat. Oh my God, I forgot about that. So so I'm just going to quickly look. It might still be there. Yeah, 308 weeks ago, 297 weeks ago. What's the most recent message? The last one is from me, and it says, if your laptop is unplugged from the wall, then they can't track you. Just say you have a TV license and they can't check as long as you close the tab before plugging back in. I feel like Sam would approve of that. And then there's a Hogwarts fan fiction. Oh dear. Anyway. God, that is one thing about going back to season one, huh? Is Keller Brody loves Harry Potter, and I... Tragic. Yeah. But anyway... But anyway, yeah, so you introduced me to it. I don't remember how I found it at all. Oh my god, no, I know exactly how I found it. It was in the very, very small Shapeshifter fandom. Somebody said, hey, this is just like the Shapeshifter, but imagine if they were adults and they got real therapy instead of a random teacher being like, hey kid, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder. Good luck with that. I guess you're just (laughs) going to have panic attacks now. And the character being like, okay, okay, thanks. (laughs) So, you know, that's how I found it. Oh my god. And then I started listening to it and I caught up to safe house i want to say Mm. let's just say it was very uh dramatic and i was dying slightly so i think i then started running my mouth to everyone (laughs) about it and there's that tiktok trend going around at the moment about like the book talk starter pack have you seen that no one of the prompts in it is uh what's the book that you've got the most people to read and i keep thinking i don't know the book that i've got the most people to read but the media i've got the most people to experience is the bright sessions because it's rippled out in strange strange ways I've had multiple therapists listen to the Bright Sessions because of me. I remember multiple like friends that I got to listen to it who then got other people to listen to it. And I'm like, it all comes back to Soren. The Bright Sessions team, you should put me on your marketing team, basically, because <laughs> I've never shut up about the Bright Sessions for a minute. Yeah. And we've been obsessed with audio drama ever since. Yeah, I feel like it is really the thing that got me into audio drama in that I do love Night Vale and it was my start and I will never forget my roots. Night Vale is so much its own thing that it kind of, I couldn't see the medium past it, if that makes sense. I was just too caught up in this new weird thing and the fact that it actually had non-binary characters and gay characters and stuff and that was kind of the first time I was seeing that so I wasn't thinking about the fact that it was an audio medium but then with the Bright Sessions I was like oh audio mediums now we have a podcast production now (laughs) (laughs) yeah I feel like if I'd only listened to Welcome to Night Vale it wouldn't have done Hmm. like it wouldn't have done it for me but yeah Bright Sessions like I don't know turned on a light in my brain that just Mm -hmm. made me go, oh, this is what storytelling can be in an audio medium. You can just talk about characters and talk about mental health without any holds barred. Yeah, I think it's because we are both such character-driven people in the media that we like. And Night Vale does a little bit of that, but it definitely takes a long time to get into the characters. It doesn't necessarily move the plot along. Whereas I feel like everything in the Bright Sessions does, even if listening to season one for the first time, it doesn't necessarily seem that way. Re-listening to season one, you're like, oh, okay, wow, okay. (laughs) 
It's all coming together. Yes. Also, one thing that I found funny re-listening to season one was I was so sure that Damien's episode is the end of season one, his first episode. Right, yeah. I was so confident because I was like, that's like a huge cliffhanger in terms of you learn about the AM and you learn about all of these other people. That's kind of the first power that you see being used, not maliciously, really, but irresponsibly, I guess. Mm. Actively. Yeah. But no... And then I was thinking about it, and I was chatting to someone about it, and I was like, maybe it's because they hadn't actually cast Damien or Mark Mm. or Owen at that point. And I think that might be the case. Potentially. Because I can imagine if you've written Damien, or you know who Damien is going to be, you have like a very clear idea of what you want for him. And if you don't have anything to show for a project, you might not be able to find that person. Yeah. I don't know how to talk about this show. (laughs) It just, like... The words. Do you I know what I mean? Problem. No, I do know what you mean. <laughs> okay, here's a question. Seasons one and two only, favourite mm. character. Pretend that seasons three, four, and then AM archives and the college tapes I don't mean, exist. Specifically plot wise in season one and two, it would be Caleb probably. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just love Caleb, like with all my heart. I think Brig and Snow does such a stunning job. He really does. Portraying this like child. <laughs> basically compared to all the other characters when like all the actors are kind of like the same age i'm assuming but like caleb feels younger and there's like voice breaks when he's like getting stressed Mm. that just like get me every bloody time caleb is so special to me the jock emo dynamic the like empath Mm. the vibes there's like things he does later in like other seasons i'm like this is so me coded and i love him and i just love him I always forget how surly he is in season one and like he's so grumpy. how teenage boy he is and he says things and it's like Christ Caleb, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny listening back to it, like knowing how it goes and mm. listening specifically to Joan and how she is just sitting there going, You are gay. So long suffering. She's like, for Christ's sake. When she has to talk him through why do you think that Adam reacted that way? Why do you think? <laughs> Take a sec. It's so walk funny. it back. I totally forgot as well that she basically just says it. She's trying to get him to come to the realization. And then she finally just goes, Do you think that Adam is upset that you felt his feelings for you? And he's like, Oh, <laughs> It's like she was trying so hard to help him get there on his own, and then she was just like, "Whatever, it's fine." <laughs> it is the big, like, big sister energy coming out of yeah. her, being mm-hmm. like, "Fuck's sake, these bisexual boys who I have to somehow parent." Jesus Christ, it's beautiful. They just keep appearing. What can you do? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, who is your favorite character just in season one and two, based on plot? I will say, with all honesty, that. Even in season two, even on my first listen, I became obsessed with Mark despite his complete lack of appearance because of the tiny little things that we learn about him. I think it's that really enticing thing where you don't actually get to meet a character, but you keep hearing about them from different people. And then it's very easy to sort of become obsessed with them, at least if you're me. They do such a good job of like peppering him in. And then he actually like is everything you hope. Like he's completely different to most people's perception of him, but he's still like... He pulls it off. I think that is mainly the actor. I mean, we can't talk about it too much because it's season three, but, you know. Exactly. I distinctly remember, it's why I used it as my intro, when Sam comes back and is chatting about Mark and says, I was updating him on the slang and he hated YOLO, but I think he liked Bay. I remember at that moment, I was like, oh no, I'm obsessed with him. <laughs> I remember thinking that when I heard that. I was like, I don't even know this man. I feel like we should tell the listeners that you are very obsessed with Mark. You, that he's like, he is Mark. your OG character. He's living rent free in my brain at all times every day, regardless of what I want. I think on a first listen, he didn't really do much for me because I was really? just like, vibe. I think I was just vibing. Shocking. But like, yeah, re- I've li- re listened to the show so many times now and looking at it specifically through your lens, knowing that he was your favorite character, I'm like, oh my God, Mark, why did I not? get him on a first listen why was i so obsessed with all these other bitches when mark is out here you know i promise i will not talk about mark for this entire <laughs> episode but i will say season two is really interesting from that you are just getting everyone else's opinions of him the whole crux of joan's motivation in season one is whatever she has to do with this mark person who she's saying cryptic things about at the end of her recordings and then in season two it becomes clear like what she actually wants but everyone keeps talking about mark in terms of like themselves do you know what i mean Even when Sam is like, I didn't want to tell him that I'm working with you to try and find a way out to Joan in case I gave him false hope. 
she then like follows that up with, also, I didn't want to break the budding romance that we're having. Mm. And even when Joan is like, why didn't you tell me that we were working with him? It seems to come more from a place of, now he's going to think that I don't care about him. Mm. As opposed to, can you imagine how freaked out and upset he'll be? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, mm, this is interesting. This is this is hurting my feeling. Yeah. But to be fair, thinking about just characters that like actually appear and have more than like three lines in season mm-hmm. two, Damien does kind of shine as well. The actor is insane. God, yeah. Everyone is fantastic though. Joan. Unappreciated fave. Unappreciated fave. Set the standard for weird therapists in podcasts. Yeah. She is the trope definer. <laughs> she is. It's a small trope, but it's that. She's just so she's so repressed she's so i just need to get to the end of this and then everything will be fine but it's also been five years and everything is still not fine it's very funny actually re-listening to joan with a psychology degree because it's so clear that she's just doing things for her own motives and not doing actual therapy like 50 (laughs) percent of the time and it's like oh my god please stop oh the boundaries she is breaking no it's so bad and it's to be fair i've heard people complain about this as if it's not a factor of her personality and it drives me crazy like i've heard people be like oh why is the bright session so anti-medication and it's like do you think that joan told sam not to take medication because she doesn't like it she told sam not to take medication because if sam suppressed her power with medication then she would never get mark back it was an entirely selfish you're not supposed to listen to her <laughs> yeah everyone is incredibly biased <laughs> Honestly. I feel like this set the standard for unreliable narrators in podcasts as well. Mm, yeah. Joan is just so good. Honestly, Joan's little like asides at the end are the original supplemental. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it's so like, oh yeah, this is a normal therapy session, and then like, I think we can get him out. <laughs> the tone change is like, ah, uh, it, it she's just recording all of these out loud in her office is so funny to me though. She doesn't even go, anyway, I hope to achieve this in the session. Okay, come in. She just goes, I think we can do this in this session. And then they just walk in conveniently. Joan is an atypical confirmed and she can just see through walls and she just never tells anybody. You know, the fact that she learned that habit from Green. Can we talk oh about God, Green for I a sec? About that. Yes, no, please because... let's talk about Green. I wanted to. Oh, I just, on a re-listen, you can see, like, even in the writing, how... Obviously, we only know about him originally through Joan's perspective, and so we expect this monster. Even when we experience him, we still get the impression that he is doing everything that he thinks is right, and he is so genuinely dedicated to helping atypicals. He's kind of the only person in the show who is, because Joan has got her all her ulterior motives. Green... He's doing it wrong, but he genuinely does care about atypicals. And you see that a lot more in the AM archives. It's so interesting on a re-listen because originally you are seeing it all through Joan's eyes. And so you don't really notice those little bits of like him genuinely caring. And he's so important to me, even though he's like, he's just, yeah. The little minute where um, Chloe is eavesdropping telepathically and he walks in and he goes, ah, he's thinking about how pretty she is. And then he's like, wait, no. Bright green... It's the, the shippest ship to ever ship. It's so broken. It's so upsetting. It's so tragic. I love him, Your Honor. Also, you know, not to uh, say anything that could be inferred by anyone who might be listening for the first time, but I found it very interesting, the references to the director of the AM here. All the little build-ups. There's definitely some allusions to characters that will come in later, which are fun. Yes. Certain things that aren't really even allusions, but are just straight up mentions that like <laughs> definitely went over my head before. It's so well written. It's so it's good. It's so well written. In terms of foreshadowing, you're like, oh, this is just sort of information. And then afterwards you're like, hang on, no. Why would we be you know, mentioning this in this much detail or by name? And it kind of seems obvious in retrospect, but at the time it just feels really natural. The dialogue all feels so smooth. I genuinely think that this show is what taught me to write dialogue. Obviously, there is a certain amount of fan fiction that I have read and written and maybe not published. Learning how to do those voices and write like that in their voice definitely shaped how I write my own podcast, for example. Caleb's voice specifically. It just fits in my brain the moment I hear it. I'm like, oh my god. It's like coming home. Yeah, I'm on a little writing course at the moment and they were talking about watching TV to like get dialogue across and I was just thinking, listen to audio drama because the dialogue and audio drama has to be everything, particularly if there's no narration. And if you want to get information that feels natural, I mean, it has to be well-written audio drama, but I feel like this is such a good example of it because nothing is like, the gun in my left hand is loaded. (laughs) Even though the sound design is quite simple to begin with. And also, I mean, like I will admit, The sound quality at the beginning isn't good, which is also shocking. And I don't say this to be mean, I just say this to be like, wow, because I felt like I didn't realise that until I started doing podcasty things. And I'm like, wow, 
it wasn't good. They did improve very quickly, but still. Mm. Yeah. I feel like I've seen photos of them being in actual recording rooms. And I feel like especially in season two, they may have like used that to simulate the office. For example, like when Caleb is further away and then closer Mm. to the mic when he like storms in and stuff like that. I feel like it's possible they may have actually like done situational stuff. Yeah, they did like a live Q&A from the studio that they used once. I'm not sure when they started using it. Because we are in the age now of podcasting from different places over Mm. Zoom or Discord. And I feel like that has become a lot more commonplace, especially since the pandemic. But beforehand, most recording for podcasts was done on location. So we're coming at it from a different angle and being like, how does that work? What do you mean you can see the other actors properly? Like, that's strange. Sounds helpful. (laughs) (laughs) You can imagine like actual like acting being done, like especially when like Damien's talking, you can imagine him going like and like moving his hands around a lot. I feel like he's a gesticulating kind of guy. Yeah. Particularly when he's kind of being like, what, me... Me, I'd never do anything terrible. I have <laughs> never killed anyone. <laughs> the discussions about Damien's never really done anything bad with his power. Oof. Listeners, go read the the second Bright Sessions book, which is just Damien's backstory. Mm-hmm. And then come back. <laughs> and then return. And then reflect. <laughs> To be fair, though, taking him in the context of this, I do think he's so interesting, like, particularly the conversation that he has with Chloe. It's just like, this guy is so lonely. He's trying so hard to make a friend, and he's doing it so badly. (laughs) That's clearly all he wants. It is one of my favourite takes on that power, because we've seen it in, like, a lot Mm. of other media. Even Joan, when she's talking about him, sympathises with his predicament and says, like, well, if I had that power, I would be so much worse. Yeah. It's very interesting and allows you to get him in a way more nuanced way which makes him not really a villain because i feel like damien does some terrible things throughout the whole of canon but he's not really ever like classified as a true villain and i think it's because his motivation is i mean i feel like we can talk about a little bit because this does end with him kidnapping (laughs) mark but his motivation is basically just that he is lonely the whole time so it's kind of hard to make that into. It's not like you can have a villain arc about that in a way, if that makes sense. I think it does help. Like the show is so mental health focused that, like, even mm. the villainous characters, quote unquote, are like so empathised with. I love him, Your Honor. I love them all. I love them all. <laughs> I love Sam with her cat and her panic attacks and just. <sighs> I have to admit, like, I do love Sam wholeheartedly. I did kind of find her like hard to deal with like on my first listen, but I think that was because at 17 and consumed by anxiety and also having trouble leaving the house, she was way too, she was Mm. way too close to home. She's so like insanely traumatized though. I always forget that she's like, yeah, I've been to World War One. It's like, oh. That's really um, brushed over. You need to get a real therapist who is not trying to exploit you. Please, please actually go to the AM for one of their like two week courses and get a real therapist. Well, not right now. Don't go right right now. now. No, later on. You know, she's been shot. She's gone for weeks without food. Yeah. In fairness, apparently she doesn't get that hungry, but still. I've been thinking about this, okay? Because, like, Mm -hmm. your metabolism slows down because you're time traveling, whatever, okay? But when you return back to the present, if you're doing that really often, your metabolism is fucked permanently. Like, that's that's just how it works. Yeah. So, like, what are the consequences? What are the long reaching consequences of this superpower? Tell me now, Lauren Shivlin. The other thing that I was thinking about was she's like, oh, sometimes I'm gone for weeks. And I'm like, hang on, fine. Okay, your metabolism slows down. So I guess you're not aging either at the same rate that you would be. But mentally, you're conscious. So how long has Sam actually been alive from her point of view? Like how old is Sam if you add up all of the extra weeks in ancient Greece and 20s New York? and wherever That's else. That's so true. I feel like she's suppressing that knowledge. I feel like she's like, we're just not going to think about it. To be fair, I was feeling a little bit called out by Sam on one front in that she was like, wow, haven't had my first kiss at 25. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it's so funny to me as well that like, I, d- I don't know if we can say this, but like the fact that she's having that conversation with an ace person yes. who's like, oh my God, you like, yeah, you know, romance, romance. And Babes, <laughs> what do you mean? I don't feel like Chloe's sexuality is a spoiler. I feel like it's very heavily implied to begin with as well. Yeah, definitely I picked up on it more. Yeah, if you know that it's there. This could have been the first Ace character I came across in fiction. I don't remember. I think Maybe. it was for me. I think uh, genuinely it went Chloe, Jonathan Sims. That's a long gap as well. Damn. Maybe I had Loveless in between. In which mm. case I had all the other Alice Osman books. But like... This show was so good for representation, at least in the queer zone and also in the mental health zone 
Yeah, I was doing it back in the day. I also like how, you know, in the stakeout episodes, when they're talking about all the different people that they see come out of Joan's office. And again, when Green is interviewing Joan, those characters actually do like turn up in like bonus episodes later. Yeah, that's so fun. There's a non-binary character who's literally explicitly referred to with they them pronouns both in the original episode and then in the bonus episode which is cool the sound design is also really fun i love sam's whooshing noises for her time travel misha stanton is just one of like the og sound designers in audio drama yeah but they're just so good they're like so they good. really set the standard mm. and it's so funny like listening to the credits and hearing like oh misha stanton lauren shippen and being like i could name like seven different audio dramas i've listened to with these same people on them yeah it's so funny <laughs> Like podcasting, indie podcasting a circle, but indie podcasting was like a very small dot back in those days. It was a pool days. party, apparently. It was a pool party, apparently. <laughs> For those who are listening to this and may not know, Lauren Shippen held a pool party once with most of the audio drama creators at the time, allegedly in attendance as far as I'm aware. Or it was just some just podcasters, right? Not even audio drama. Yeah. Yeah. It was like most of the multitude network and then like atypical artists. And that was basically the extent of podcasting back then. <laughs> yeah, Nightbell were there, right? I feel like they were there. I don't remember. I definitely I've mainly know heard each about other. this through multitudes, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the fabled pool party. We used to have jokes, being like, we'll have our own British pool party British one, one day. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We just have to wait for the one day of summer. Yeah, one of us has to buy a house with oh, a God. pool. <laughs> so that's at least 20 it years old. It can off. be held at a public pool. Yes. Maybe. That sounds like the most suspicious audio drama meetup ever. <laughs> Come to the local pool, everybody. It's like that episode of Sherlock when John Lydia gets murdered. <laughs> Come oh to the God. local pool, we have Jonathan Sims. Oh God, I'm losing my mind now. You're welcome. Morgan, one thing that I wanted to ask about is I remember you saying that Chloe's angel theory grated on you to begin with. And I'm curious to see if your opinion is the same. Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> I just, I'm just wondering. I don't know why. It just mm. really... <laughs> I don't know. When she's like, yeah, it's the angels. Because that's the first thing she went to. Just use your brain, please, Chloe. I'm begging you. Why have you gone here first? Does it make sense? Why do you refuse to believe telepathy when your mother is literally telekinetic? Please. What do you mean? <laughs> I can understand Caleb doing it. What do you mean? <laughs> To be fair, she's not reading minds in the sense of, like, hearing people's thoughts to begin with, which is something that I forgot. She's just getting knowledge, like, placed into her brain. Like, she's chilling with her mum, and then she's just like, wow, you had a baby that died before me, and I just know this now. That's that's pretty wild. I'm, I I'm, I'm not saying that, that's the, <laughs> that I would jump to the conclusion of angels telling me secrets, because I definitely wouldn't. <laughs> but... <laughs> like, it's not grating on me and, like, a writing perspective it's just chloe yeah. as a character took yeah. the most time for me to warm up to because mm. she had that false start of just being a fucking dumbass i think that's fair i feel like i've heard a few too many people who were very like manifestation faith healing angels and i feel like her proximity in that zone at the beginning also put me off for a little bit or i'm like okay although hang on i just want to say at one point Joe, she's chatting to Chloe and she's chatting about who they are interested in in terms of powers and she explains that they probably wouldn't be interested in Chloe because their powers dime a dozen, at least in this universe. And she mentions as well that the AM aren't particularly interested in mediums because they don't really believe in mediums. And I was like, hang on, have we got a confirmed afterlife in the Bright Sessions? So, you know, maybe Chloe's right to talk about angels because apparently... Joan is saying that mediums exist, or at least she thinks that they do, and she's not going to be like, oh, I think that they do because you say that you are. She would be doing research and reading research. I swear she says that they don't believe that any of that is possible. Like, I think they say, like, prediction and, like, the afterlife are both, like, out. They're not real. No, she says that the AM thinks that they aren't real. She says it in a disparaging way. She says, oh, the AM have trouble believing in precognition and mediums, even though, like, telekinetics exist. Kind of, which is a huge. <laughs> I completely like <laughs> missed that. I can definitely see why Lauren Shipper never brought it back in ever because it's a huge writing issue on so many levels to confirm an afterlife or to have people who can see the future. But I was like, wait, <laughs> hang on, <laughs> hang on. There's just so many implications. Considering how like absolutely batshit the powers get later in this show, 
it is quite funny to me. I do love how we start like entirely with not passive powers, but like predominantly like mental and personal powers. And we don't really ever gravitate towards like more like flashy superhero powers, except in like bonus material and like sort of side characters. Yeah, and spin-offs, I guess, get a few more. Yeah, I feel like it helps add to the sort of like low-key everyday focus of the show. Yeah. Jumping off what you were saying, I wonder if that's because it being an audio medium, there's no point to doing, you know, special effects or anything that are flashy in terms of lightning shooting out of somebody's hands or pyrokinesis. I mean, you can do cool sound effects and people have valence comes to mind, which has kind of a lot of flashy power. I don't know if this is just the like circles I've been in, but I feel like fantasy, like high fantasy is not really a thing in audio drama. And I feel like one of the reasons for that is the sound of magic is like, not exactly hard to do, but like hard to do well without it just being like sparkles. Not to talk about the attic monologues too much, but like even in that, like a character turns into a bird and you have no idea how hard that was to convey listener. And I'm not even sure we did it that well. (laughs) I do think there is something to be said for the fact that you can hear a sound in an audio medium and not necessarily know what it is because you don't have the context. You can hide things from the audience in a very interesting way that you can't really do with any other medium where you literally like show them something because they are deprived of one sense. They don't know. And then you can come back later and be like, oh, that's what that sound meant. I'm trying to think of another example, but I'm sure I've heard other shows use it. For example, what happens to Sasha James at the end of Magus Archive season one? Like, the audience heard exactly what happened and has no idea. Also, I wanted to bring up Adam. Adam, my boy, my son, Adam. my child. <laughs> because it was the Vine era when the Rise Sessions was coming out, I always think about that Vine. Ah, oh, yes. Talk about Adam, Soren. I don't know what to say about Adam. I just love him. He's also a good character in that, like, in the same way as Mark, you hear about him for so long before you actually get to meet him and it's such a good payoff. And I remember his voice being so different to, like, the way I'd imagined it. I'd imagined him being all, like, I don't know, whispery and quiet. And he's just like, what the fuck is happening? And he was like, oh, (laughs) it was this angry little boy. He's so good. He's so interesting because you hear about him and you're just like, ah, yes, a depressed little emo bee. And then you just get this, like, rage and this, like, very hyper-intelligent, English student. He's just trying so hard, but he's so sad all the time. And he's just an icon. And his parents are committing war crimes, but it's fine. (laughs) But he doesn't know. He doesn't know. I think that that was sort of the era of soft gay boys. Like, if you did get representation, it would be very one note. And it would also be like they weren't allowed to be actual teenage boys and they weren't allowed to have nuance and be kind of morally grey and be kind of selfish at times. Caleb and Adam feel very human. Like they feel like real people who you would meet. They're very flawed. I love them both. Mm, They're both fairly mask, which I feel like was not Mm. a very big thing in like queer relationships. Yeah. In in media. Yeah, especially if you lean into the jock nerd stereotype, I feel like that can easily be like turned up to 11. One of them is the man, and one of them is like the shrinking violet. It's like, well, if you really have to choose between the two of them, Adam is definitely the one who's like fighting somebody, and Caleb's just there with his herbal tea being like, please, can we chill out? (laughs) Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. I think not to like reference the books too much, because obviously... Those are slightly different. But like the first book, The Infinite Noise, which is just the first couple seasons from Adam and Kate's point of view, you get so much of Adam in so little time. And yet just hearing from his point of view feels so different. The way that Lauren Shippen writes about his depression, for example, is just, like, I remember reading that bit. Oh, okay. I've not read about this properly. And it's like when I read, I was born for this whilst I was deep in anxiety era. And was like, oh, no, okay. He's just the voices. The voices. I love how everyone's mental illness is represented even in the context of the show alone and even in the context of the first two seasons alone. Like, we know that Sam has an anxiety disorder rather than just like, oh, she's a bit of a warrior. It's like, okay, no, this woman is ill. (laughs) And the same with Adam. And I feel like Sam initially comes off as a bit of a stereotype because she's very like, oh, no, like she comes in and... Joan's like, is it Sam or Samantha? And Sam's like, whatever you want. But as soon as she kind of gets through the very worst of it, she very much comes into her own. And she doesn't feel like a stereotype, despite the fact that her anxiety doesn't evaporate at any point. Especially with the whole Mark driving her to deal with it in some ways. For example, the fact that she's like, okay, I need to go look for Mark, so I'm going to learn to drive. It doesn't 
just evaporate because she like has a quest now she's still like i've pulled over because i feel like i'm gonna have an anxiety attack so i'm just gonna chat to you for a bit in that final episode of season two because that's not how mental illness works and also adam isn't like constantly moping around and on the verge of tears like he has other emotions which i feel like is a big depression misconception yeah but his depression isn't like cured by caleb again that too yeah and particularly you have the like the proper backslide when they, as Joan puts it, get out of the honeymoon period and things get a bit worse. And like when they like, they have a date over Skype instead of going over to his house because he's like, Ash, I need some space. A, because I need to be alone right now. But B, because if you come over here, then you're going to have to feel this too. And that's not mm. going to vibe for any of us. God, that's another example of like the superpowers working so well to explore real world issues. Like the real world issue of having a partner with depression, particularly as a very empathetic person. It's just, it's so good. Fantasy is a metaphor for the human condition, indeed, and also sometimes sci-fi. Oh, this show. I feel like we're not, we can't fully express how much this show... Yeah, I mean, with what you were saying about dialogue, that's so true. But I think it's also about the themes that we... Not even that it made us find them interesting, because we already found them interesting, but it was one of the first places we got to see them get dug into in a specific way. Consolidated our interest. Yeah. It is like those slice of life fan fictions that are also really heavy, but that's the whole show in lots of ways. Which is, like, the vibe. Perfect. yeah. That's what I want from fiction. I just want the slice of life in a fantasy setting. I want Avengers fandom 2012 era, you know? Yeah. Except I wasn't oh ever actually God. really in that fandom, but, you know. Neither, but I feel like Lauren Schiffen was. I feel like... Oh, yeah, she she's a big Stacky yeah. fan, as far oh as I'm God. aware. Everything makes sense now. And a Supernatural fan, which like also parallels fairly well. I wouldn't know this. You have to give us your expertise. In later seasons especially, the mental health aspect is a lot more dug into. Yeah, and I know that one of the people who works on the college tapes, which is the sequel show for this show, also wrote a couple episodes of Supernatural. And the one Supernatural episode that I remember that she wrote is one where one of the main characters goes like, drinking and repressing your feelings is not the same as going to therapy or something like that. And the other character goes, yeah, it is. And it's just like, <laughs> we're addressing the trauma. Crazy. Therapy versus the amount of books I buy every week. Hmm. Which one is cheaper? <laughs> I do low-key hate that Joan's therapy is almost all meditation. But I do feel like in that era of psychology, the field has moved on so much in the last, God, like 10 years. This is making me feel old. A little bit less than 10 years. There's a couple of things that they say that really age it. I can't remember off the top of my head now. To be fair, the Skype date ages it because we're in the Zoom era now. Nobody would Skype anybody for any reason. I remember hearing the sound on the read and being like, oh my god, I feel like I'm 13 and sending people the roast turkey emoji again. <laughs> what is happening? Oh, back in the day. I've lost the thread of what I was saying before I was saying that now. Meditation. Good god, that doesn't work for everyone and particularly it can be antithetical to progress with people with severe anxiety which sam has but you know she also is being triggered into panic attacks by her therapist on purpose so maybe that was just all part of joan's evil plan maybe she was very abreast of the research and she went mm, maybe meditation isn't all it's cracked up to be let's make sam meditate and see how it goes oh dear yeah no she clearly does legitimately want to help as well but it's just that almost everyone is doing their breathing exercises and it does fit a little bit one size fits all and i guess i can kind of see where that whole medication thing comes from because they do bring in the thing of well uh, atypical physiology is different and therefore medication won't work for you which doesn't make any sense that's all i'm gonna say about that please address this lauren Shepard. it doesn't make i mean to be fair i feel like i can say this now if atypical physiology is different that means that it has to be consistently different because mark can mirror everybody's power if it was different for each person if for example a pyrokinetic had like different glands that could secrete fire or something you know, then I guess there would be something to be said for the fact that like, oh, okay, everyone's different. We don't know how anything's going to interact with you. Although, again, like your, your dopamine systems and your serotonin systems, I don't know why they would all be affected. You know, maybe in the case of like mental powers, like telepaths and empaths and things, you could make arguments about like they're receiving emotions in a very different way than we are usually. But Christ, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. I just had to have this little rant already, apparently. I was going to save it for later because there's things that happen later that makes it more fraught to me. <laughs> But at this point, we've got Mark, and he's my little example where I can be like, look, this doesn't make any sense, because he can do them all. I thought you were going to say my little meow meow, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that tracks. I mean, that's true, but still, I don't have to say. If, like, depression meds don't work on atypicals, do paracetamol? I'm a pro Exactly. Friend. 
Exactly. Any and why is it not coming ever? up early from the beginning? Because medicine isn't like a, you're not working on a given system, everything interacts. That's how your body works in general. So how does your metabolism work? How do you drink water the same way as everyone else? Like you've got to start going down to the bottom. Did none of these people ever have their appendix burst? Should nobody break an arm and go to the hospital and then get x-rayed? And they're like, wow, your bones are different. If it's so different, which is what is implied Maybe here. atypicals are like Kitsune from Teen Wolf in that they just don't get ill. Does anybody ever get ill on the show? No. You're right. Now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like this is a good conspiracy theory because I don't actually think that anyone does ever get ill. That's the real reason they're being experimented on is because they just are well all the <laughs> oh time. Oh my god, wait. I feel like surely one of the actors has to have had a cold for one recording. But I don't feel like I remember anyone ever getting ill over that much time. But then also, how does alcohol work? Yeah, exactly. How does any drugs interact with their system? Because again, we're implying that like pharmaceuticals are meaningfully different from like cannabis, which technically no, they're all just things that do different things to your systems. I don't know. Listen, do I remember anything from my psychology degree? No, but also I do remember enough to be like, this doesn't really make any sense. But I was also, I kind of also don't believe that Joan is telling the truth when she says this. It's just that it comes up again later and she says it like she's telling the truth later in different contexts. And I'm like, hang on. Green says it as well. Yeah, Green also says it. And Green wouldn't have a reason to lie about it. When he's talking to Damien. Damien. Like, but also he could be lying to Damien in theory at that point. But Green wouldn't. Green wouldn't lie about that. I'm sorry. I genuinely don't. Th- we don't know him that well in season one or season two. I genuinely don't think he would be lying. No, I don't think that either. But Green is just a ball of sunshine. <gasps> but he could be. In season two, he could be. We don't know this man. But we know this man. We know that this man is the goodest egg to ever is egg. He's he also kind of is terrible. He- I feel like you're a lot more forgiving of Green than I am, and I don't want to get too into it, but we do know what he's done here, so I guess we can. I find him really interesting, and I think he's one of my, like, oh no, yeah, niche characters that I'm just like, I am obsessed with how your brain works, and it is <laughs> really interesting to me. I really love people who are, like, lawful neutral, I want to say. I just, that archetype of character is so interesting to me, and we can't discuss it too much because of things but we'll get more into green we all have we all have things to say about green we're going to screaming soundlessly behind the mic (laughs) (laughs) i love him so much and i can't explain to the listener why i don't know i feel like especially season one and two i find it really hard to like him because he's being so he's being so weird with joan she'll say something and then he'll be like yelling and then he'll like reel it back and i'm like you know what she's right to be sniping at you so yeah no 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 definitely obviously when i first listened to the show i was like green whatever okay but like yeah now i'm like he was just trying to do what he thought was right everyone is vaguely fairly morally gray in this show and i love it Mm. so much but they're not like extreme I do find the interaction so funny between them. It's the bit where, like, he's like, Joan, and then she's like, it's Dr. Bright to you, and then, like, five minutes later, he's like, Dr. Bright, and she's like, oh, so it's Dr. Bright now? I love that. (laughs) That's such good writing. They're so well-written as exes. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. It's really fun introducing someone with that personal relationship to Dr. Bright at that point as well, because we haven't had anyone really. Like, we know that she has a relationship with Mark, but she has no friends. (laughs) As everyone keeps making fun of her for. We so. has to admit that Damien is her closest friend. Yeah. It gets me every time. <laughs> she's so lonely as well. And she's so like, I, I'm not lonely. I have my job. I have my mission to get Mark back. Why would I need anything else? And it's like, babes, please go to a therapist yourself. Is that not a legal requirement in the US, please? Oh my God. Wait, no. Spinoff show that's just the therapist of Joan because she probably does have a therapist (laughs) and I want to know. No, I don't think she trusts anyone enough to have a therapist. She's probably got, she's wriggled out of it with her AM situation I bet. Oh, she desperately needs a therapist. Oh, she desperately does. She does. I think when we were doing our podcast recommendation, Lucky Dip for the Ex University Podcast Society Fair at Freshers Fair, I think the prompt I put for the right sessions was therapy, but that your therapist needs therapy more than you do. (laughs) Yeah. That's exactly what this show is. <laughs> Maybe as much. Sam definitely also very badly needs therapy. But she doesn't really get it in this show either, so... I feel like the person who benefits most from actual therapy in the show is Caleb. Yeah, maybe. I'm thinking of a certain thing that happens in, like, season three. But, like, 
that just like shows that everyone's on completely different wavelengths. It is so funny as well, Caleb ringing up, which I will sort of slightly spoiler adjacently say is a bit of a recurring pattern. Caleb ringing up and interrupting the plot with his Adam drama is so funny <laughs> to me, and it will never stop being my favorite thing. Like Joan is like, okay, we're breaking my brother out of a high security facility, and then she gets a phone call, and it's Caleb being like, things aren't going well with. Adam. It's such a good recurring bit, though. <laughs> It's so good. He's just so like, good. I am a high school teenager. This is the most important thing that has ever happened to me. My life is ending. Literally. And she's like, babes. <laughs> this is the most important thing that's ever happened to him. Can we also talk about the fact that Caleb is so demisexual coded? I don't feel like it ever gets yes. said, said, but yes, yes, it's yes, so yes, yes. cute. And I love that it comes up in season two where Adam is like, oh, Tom Hardy. And Joan is like, does Tom Hardy not do it for you? And she, he's like, no. And she's like, well, who does? And he's like, Adam. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Demisexual, my beloved. And he's just so confused about romance and attraction in general. And that just feels so demisexual to me. He's just like, I don't get it. Caitlin is out there like, hey, I'm having normal feelings for you. And he's like, wait, wait. And he can literally feel them. And he's still like, wait, what, what is the fuck this? Is this? <laughs> uh, Caitlin, silent MVP of the whole yes. podcast. I feel like that makes no sense to the listeners, but like... As someone who has listened to the college tapes and someone who has read The Infinite Noise, I'm like, I love her. And I would honestly read like a whole spin off about her just like observing from the outside. Honestly. Because I think it's very funny. God, imagine being Caitlin. You'd be so confused for so long. Even the way that Adam and Caleb start interacting. Like, no wonder Adam is so distrustful of Caleb to begin with, because from Adam's perspective, he gave a presentation about Macbeth. The football team were bullying him, like something out of a Mean Girls movie or something. Caleb steps in and is like, uh, leave him alone. He's so depressed. Adam's like, wow, okay, everyone hates me, I guess. I'm just going to continue living my life. And then this random football player is like, hey, do you want to have a lunch with me? And you're like, yes for some reason why does adam even say yes maybe he just thought he was cute maybe that was already happening i don't know i can't remember the order of events but he was like yeah sure and then they became soulmates immediately what (laughs) it's just so beautiful (laughs) Mm. it's so perfect i love them so much yes god so many little bits of foreshadowing the conversation about the witches taking away Macbeth's free will in the context of the English presentation that Caleb gets freaked out about, really seed in those plot lines early. I can't wait until we get to talk about the Pokemon <laughs> evolution. That's all I'll say. I wonder how much Shippen like had planned out, or how much he was like, "Oh, this would just be like an interesting idea, and then maybe I can capitalize on it." And then she just capitalized on everything. It feels like the Frank stuff is interesting as well because I was kind of wondering. He comes up in season one, but I wasn't sure whether his empathy situation was planned from season one. I couldn't really tell. Shouldn't have said that. I do feel like a lot of the flag that this show gets, because I have seen it get some pretty serious flag, is from people taking characters' opinions really seriously, as if they're the creators' opinions. And I'm like, actually, everyone just kind of is terrible. Not everyone is terrible. Caleb isn't terrible. But you know what I mean. They're all, like, low-key morally grey. It's not, like, big extremes of, like, you know, what we see in, like, romanticy these days. But it is vaguely, like, I am here for my own interests, And I haven't really thought about my moral code that much because my only priority right now is to get what I want. Whether like what I want is like, that is like selfish or like a goal for quote unquote greater good. And that's, that's just kind of like how humans really are. Yeah, I feel like everyone is allowed to be very realistic. Like Caleb is allowed to be a little bit homophobic at the start. Like he's like calling things gay in a disparaging way, which was so normal in 2016. And it's like, yeah. That's how a teenage boy would talk. We get to see him deconstruct it. It's not as if the show is agreeing with it. Very explicitly was not happening. <laughs> Caleb, you are a gay. Who says I'm gay? Why are you gay? <laughs> well, there's this guy who has depression. <laughs> and now I'm gay. Another thing about that is that I love that it's not like, wow, Adam's so deep because he's depressed. I feel like that could easily have happened. I feel mm. like you could have slid into that somehow. But it doesn't cough. happen. The third daughter cough. Yes, cough the third daughter cough. <laughs> I did just kind of find it kind of funny in the third daughter, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. The Bright Sessions talks extensively about mental health, and all of the characters are mentally ill, basically. But it really never romanticizes it at all. But at the same time, it doesn't show it in such a way that it's super triggering. I won't say that the Bright Sessions has never made me feel bad, because that would be a lie. But (laughs) that's clearly not its intention, if that makes sense. And anything can be triggering if it catches you at the right moment, so... 
I don't think that's the onus of a creator to be like, let me write something that will never mess anybody up, even by accident, because that's just going to happen, regardless of what you write. Yeah. It is very honest, desanitized. Mm. It's, it's what I've been looking for in fiction ever since I listened to this show. God, you're so right. I've been like, okay, now give me that. But again. Does anything actually compare to it? Because there are so many things that I've been like, this is a bit Bright Sessions S, but have any of them hit in quite the same way? No. Was it just because we were 16, <laughs> potentially? However. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like re listening to it, there's still so many things that I like appreciate about it and appreciate about it in a different way as an adult. Yeah, definitely. That's also an interesting one, re listening to it, because we were like Caleb's age, basically, when we listened to it for the first time. And now we're in like Sam territory. We're also in Chloe now, which is horrifying. Chloe felt like an adult to me in a way that I'm now like, that's a baby, actually. That's a baby. What do you mean she's still at uni? Yeah. Crazy. It's basically what? being in school. No wonder oh. she's like friends with Caleb. Yeah. We've really grown as people. <laughs> Just physically aged, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still exactly the same on the inside. Are we? I hear, I feel like I'm not. <laughs> like, no, I've definitely I've definitely changed. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's just interesting, like, coming back to this, because I have avoided re-listening to this show for such a long time, because I've been like, I've got other things to listen to. I'm so behind on all my podcasts. Mm. It's just nice having an excuse to re-listen to it and be like, wow, yeah, this is really a show that has been with me for, like, close to a decade now. Oh, God. And that's insane that it has been, it has shaped me in such a fundamental way, in, like, ways I didn't even, like, really register. And now I'm like, oh... Mm. I can trace a lot of this back to listening to the Bright Sessions when I was 16. Mm. I have this one memory of me like sitting in one of the school buildings next to one of our friends um, and being like, oh yeah, I'm listening to this show. It's like one Soren recommended to me, yada, yada, yada. And like, I have this image of my phone with like the icon on it. I don't have like any memories of secondary school, but I have that one, just like a single image in my brain. I have so many memories associated with the Bright Sessions in secondary school. One that you might remember if I tell you is us on the way back from games sharing earphones to listen to new episodes because it was Wednesday. It was every other Wednesday. I have vague memories of that. I feel like we were being absolutely feral on the bus back and people were were like, what the fuck? (laughs) People were like, what are you listening to? And then we were trying to explain it to people, which was impossible. Also, another memory that I have to bring up because it's an example of me also being feral about it. I was listening to it after school, I think waiting to be collected by my dad. And I had my headphones in and I just had ticked over to zero hour and I saw him pulling up and my phone automatically connected to the Bluetooth in the car. And he was like, hey, how was your day? And I was like, shh, no, we're listening to this, please. It's like 20 minutes long. Just, just please, just please. And he was like, that's fine. Whatever. Okay. I'll listen to this. Like, sounds interesting. So that was the first episode of the Bright Sessions he heard. He heard Jira with no context. And he oh saw me God. like stressing <laughs> out, going through it. And then he was like, what, what was that? And I told him about it. And then we listened to it together. And he's also a big fan of the Bright Sessions now. But I uh, mm-hmm. love that I subjected my father to that with absolutely no no context and with like all of the ferocity of <laughs> somebody who's solving their own murder case or something because I was like oh my god it's happening they're finally doing it they're doing the heist and then everything went so wrong and I was like oh my god I can't imagine you listening to the am I real speech just with your in dad in my the car <laughs> <laughs> that speech still gets me that like that breakdown oh my god like... well it's that breakdown of like Sam is so concerned am I real and I'm like, the thing that we should be concerned about is the fact that Mark is being gaslit. <laughs> so I'm sympathetic, Sam. I know you've dealt with your realization in the past, but come on. Oh my God. We need to go find this guy, please. We don't have time for Vanica that we need to chase him right now. We cannot leave him alone with Damien for this long. It's not going to go well. I know she can't control panic attacks. So I'm not genuinely criticizing Sam if anyone is thinking this. Yeah. I love Sam and I love Sam and Mark. And that's a great decision for me, as we will find out. <laughs> That's all we'll say. That's uh, all what a day to I'll be a say. Salmon Mark shipper. <laughs> Every day is what a day to be a Salmon Mark shipper. Have they ever? Have we ever had a good day? <laughs> Never. Have Salmon Mark shippers ever had a good day? I don't know. Have Salmon Mark ever had a good day? Debatable. I don't know either. The Am I Real speech is amazing. Another speech that always gets to me just in the pure angst factor. It's not really a speech, but just the little line. When Adam has like the pseudo breakup with Caleb. 
And then he's just left in the therapist's office. And then he says, it's not quite this, but something along the lines of, if I stop being depressed, do you think Caleb will like me again? No! Oh my god. Lauren Shippen, how dare you? I do love that conversation between Adam and Joan. It's so... Yes, it's so good. It's not funny, but it is funny. It's kind of funny, because she's like, you really need a therapist. I can't be your therapist, because I'm your boyfriend's therapist. Don't share a therapist with your partner, though. Unless you're in couples therapy, I guess. But hey. God, Adam and Caleb in couples therapy would be such a concept. All of these couples in couples therapy, Sam and Mark in couples therapy, Damien and everyone he's ever interacted with in any kind of therapy. Damien in therapy in general, because he's not in therapy, he's just in talking at Joan. Yeah. But their friendship brackets derogatory. (laughs) Damn. We're not going to sum up how we feel about the bright sessions, because we've proved that we can't do that. Yeah, we can barely talk coherently about this. We, we haven't talked about anything, I feel like. There's so much I feel like we haven't talked about anything. To talk about. That we... Is there anything else that we absolutely want to say or else we will die? Charlie, the, like, the guard for Mark Sell, who's oh just like, God. even when he's under compulsion from Damon, is like, don't hurt him. Honestly. He's a good guy. It's like, you haven't seen this guy in like two years because he's been in a coma, but like... He's been in a coma and he still cares about him and he still remembers him. The Charlie scene with Damien. Reminds me of the Owen scene with Damien, which is also really interesting because Owen is kind of trying, but he doesn't he doesn't get very far with resisting Damien. But I was thinking about Damien's power in general, and I was like, it just makes you want what he wants. But what if you're really repressed? And is that why Joan's quite good at dealing with it? Because if you don't do what you want, then surely you won't do what Damien wants you to do just because you want to. Do you know what I mean? Ooh, I like that. And does that mean that Sarah, the receptionist, is just a slave to her whims? Because Damien's like, go get coffee across the city. And she's like, great plan, and leaves work. Because I want to leave work every day in the middle of work. This is what I was thinking about, because I was listening on my lunch break. And I'm a receptionist at the moment, and I was like, yeah, I would want that too, but I wouldn't do it. (laughs) I just wanted to say that. I can see that, to be honest. I do feel like the more repressed characters are better at dealing with Damien, because they're less impulsive. Mm. Yeah, Adam is pretty good at dealing with Damien. Adam like, is pretty good at dealing with Damien. Compared to, especially compared to Caleb, but like Caleb can't deal with it for shit. So like... Is Adam good at dealing with Damien? Because when you're depressed, you kind of just don't really want anything. And therefore, it's really fun seeing how people's powers interact and also how people's mental illnesses interact with like mental powers. It's just a fun idea. I don't know if fun is even the right word. It's interesting. I feel like the first two seasons in particular, well, I guess it happens later too, but they really like dig into the speculative sciencey things with like the reaching through dimensions to get Mark out and the way that Sam's time travel works and getting into all the specific details about it. And I love that stuff. So that makes me very happy. Spicy, spicy, spicy. <laughs> it's so good. Whose gender would you steal out of the Bright Sessions cast? This is an important question before we finish. Not the cast. <laughs> the characters, I mean. But you know what I mean. This is Because we've had this conversation before about how we <laughs> picture the characters so differently. Oh yeah, that's a good point. My image of Caleb in my brain, I would steal that man's gender in a, in a heartbeat. That's fair. I feel like I picture him like, if Luke from Julie and the Phantoms had like blonde curls, like golden curls. Oh wow, okay. That is how I picture him, and you do not picture him like that at no, all. No, because you've seen my art of Caleb, yeah. so not at all. <laughs> Can you steal someone's gender based purely on their vibes, though? This is the thing. And their voice. Mm, I think yes. The number of people that I have met at uni who have very clearly stolen the gender of Martin Blackwood from the Magnus Archives <laughs> is quite a large amount. But in fairness to Martin Blackwood from the Magnus Archives, there's a very like clear fandom conception of how he looks, which is interesting because I feel like because the Bright Sessions didn't get that much fan art, like it has some, but it has less. You can't recognize people. There are still like, different interpretations of the characters a little bit. I feel like there's certain things that people gravitate towards. Like I feel like Sam's quite often a red, which is to be fair how I imagine her. That is not how I imagine her. Oh, Interesting. There you go. I feel like the person I can visualize most is probably Joan, because I feel like she's got a fairly standard design compared to other people. I think it's easier with Joan as well, because it's like Joan, because of the kind of person she is, isn't going to be like choosing a wild haircut or dressing in a surprising way like she's conforming that's very clear from everything we know about her personality yeah doesn't she canonically have a tattoo though i don't know i can't remember i know mark does but i feel like joan also does i think they have that conversation yeah but yeah no it would definitely be caleb i would still the gender of what about you oh i mean it's mark (laughs) i'm sorry i don't know (laughs) yeah there's not even a question 
<laughs> it's not a question. I think it's, again, not getting too into Mark, but I feel like this is vaguely clear from Sam's perception of him and the little bits that we get from Joan, is that he's like a very, just like a kind and open person who like strives to be nice to people. Like, this man doesn't have any toxic masculinity in there. There's none. I like that about him. And he's even bisexual. What more could you want? Oh my god. <laughs> Crazy. That's mainly a reference to that meme. That's, he's even bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're not going to sum up how we feel about the Bright Sessions, because how we feel about the Bright Sessions is deeply and all-encompassingly and every day. So do we have any recommendations for people that like the Bright Sessions? Read the books. Yeah, read the books for sure. They're so good. They're so good. And they're so different to the show, but they also like hold the exact same energy. And I love that. But they use the medium well. We didn't talk about Darwin. We're terrible at Catwatch. What, Darwin, who sounds like a human? Does he? <laughs> You're the one who said this to me. Did you I? Know, like, he sounds too human. I just wanted to say that I love Darwin and also that I love that Darwin sitting on Joan's lap is probably the first human contact that she's had for two years. So that's <laughs> good. I mean, not human contact because it's a cat. <laughs> yeah, Joan needs a hug. Please give her a hug, someone. She has no friends. She probably won't like it, though, but you should at least offer one. But Mark giving her a hug. I feel like would yeah. be the closest you could get. I feel like Caleb giving her a hug would have her like oh. be like. I feel like she would break. You're right, but she would be like, "No, I have to hold it together because I can't like cry in front of Caleb." Because I'm like, she'd be like, "I'm being so normal about this." Yeah, thanks for that hug. I'm actually, you should just leave. Just give me one sec. I'm just gonna go stand in this corner for a second. You just hear like sobbing, and then she walks back. She's like, "I'm fine." Mm-hmm. Yes, I can see it. But honestly, thank God that she was there to meddle in Caleb's relationship because re listening, I was like, would they even have gotten together? I don't feel like they would have. <laughs> no. No. They're too oblivious. They would have argued over text. They would have argued over text, never spoken again, three years later, been like, wait a second, I feel like we liked each other. Mm-mm. They needed a speed up. They needed a wake up call. They did. They did. Okay, we're going off piece. Do you have any recommendations for Bright Sessions fans? Other than read the books. Uh, do you? <laughs> I do. Okay, you go first. I mean, my first one is the obvious one of, I think that you should read the Shapeshifter books. Do they go into mental health with as much nuance and care? No. Do they still go into mental health and how they can interact with powers and explore how powers can be interestingly traumatizing and make it difficult to interact with people? Yes. And I think that they have in common that they write very realistic teenagers. So if you appreciate that with Caleb and Adam, I'm talking about the Shapeshifter series is if everybody knows about it, which is not necessarily true, even though we've done an episode on it. So I'll say that that is a middle grade British fiction book about a boy that can shapeshift into a fox, and then he goes to a school for kids with sci-fi-esque powers. Some very Bright Sessions-esque things happen, and one day I'll write that crossover that I keep saying I'll write, but I, <laughs> I haven't yet. I've been waiting for this crossover for five, maybe six years. It's probably longer than that. I've now read... The first Shapeshifter book, so you have an audience of at least one. A non-book recommendation, an audio drama recommendation. Caveat, we did like a little promotional swap with these people on the Attic Monologues, but we did it because I liked the show, so it's not like I'm doing this because I was bribed into it. Valence by Will Williams, which is a Hug House production, it's kind of like, imagine if The Bright Sessions was just doing magic instead of sci-fi. The main character, Liam, has electromancy powers, he hates them because he was raised to hate them, and his parents sort of own the tech conglomerate that is selling like magic suppressing technology. And Liam is just extremely depressed and not having a good time with his life. And then some people are like, hey, do you want to take down your parents? Do you want to join this task force of like magical people? They're called muses, which I think is very cute, short for magic users. And he's like, "Mm, I'm filled with anxiety. So I absolutely don't, but I will because it's a good idea. And I feel like that show does mental health really well and does that same intersection between mental health and fantastical elements, particularly Liam's, because you have his stream of consciousness practically the whole time as like a different narrator alongside the actual dialogue. It's also super queer, loads of trans characters, characters on the Ace Arrow spectrums, which are fun because I feel like you don't see those a lot. And there's also a therapist and things go about as well as it does in this podcast with that therapist. That's all I'll say. Oh, I have my second recommendation. Oh, go for it. And this is going to maybe sound rogue, but it's not at all. It's also a non-book and non-podcast recommendation. It is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the TV show. Oh, no, that's not rogue. Yeah, go. (laughs) You know, it's about a secret government agency, but the people on the inside of it. And it's an ensemble cast and it's very mental health focused, especially as they get more mental illnesses and trauma throughout the show and various disabilities that they acquire along the way. And it also features a therapist and it goes even worse than in this show. 
just so much worse. And it's just, oh, the mental health focus and the paralleling with powers and how they intersect is very interesting. The character focus is on par with The Bright Sessions, even though it's like a Marvel show and it's very sort of big and flashy at times, but it never forgets to like go back to the people and to really focus on character interactions and character mental health and character progression throughout all seven seasons. And I feel like I discovered them at relatively similar times. So they're both branded deeply and irrevocably into my brain. Shady government agencies. We love them. Whoop. It's the Patreons. We don't usually say what we're going to do next, but I guess we're going to do the Bright Session season three and four next, right? Yes, 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 yes. Are we going to put a gap in? Why would we put a gap in? Why would we do that when we could re-listen to the Bright Session season three and four? So we'll see you back here for that. And thank you for being a patron. Thank you. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out.